All right. <clears throat> so this is the first introduction to this schematic, this conceptual diagram of what a boat electrical DC system looks like. We're going to revisit this slide multiple times throughout the day. And as we do, many of these things are going to start making more sense. You'll notice that I'm not actually showing, for the purpose of clarity, I'm not showing any negative returns. Obviously, circuits are path in, return, right? It's a circuit. For the reason, most of the complications or all the devices are generally on the positive side of the circuit. And so what I'm showing here is really the different ways of recharging your batteries and of distributing power. I'm going to often talk about, um, oops, sorry, let me go back. I'm going to often talk about unswitch distribution, switch distribution. And what I'm doing with the arrows shows that sometimes, obviously, you got to think about a wire is really like sort of a pipe. A pipe does not tell you the direction of the flow, right? You think about water. Water can go one way or the other way. But some circuits on boats are really more of a unidirectional. Like, for example, a charger never pulls power. It always provides it. Same thing with an alternator. An alternator is never a draw of power. It only provides it. So the arrows are a way for us to express the concept of what a device does. But interestingly, a combiner can both provide power or take it. Right? And so we're going to go through all of this. And, it might be, and, I'm, and the reason I'm showing this right now is I want everyone in the room to get a sense of what we're going to cover. And as the day progresses, we're going to revisit that slide many times today. And we're going to go through every single one of those devices and understand what they do and why you would have one on your boat. This is a, another what I call a conceptual diagram, this time on the AC. I'm not showing the neutrals. You'll see pretty much everything except other than the galvanic isolator, which I'm kind of indicating with a green wire. Pretty much everything, again, is what's called a one-line diagram. You wouldn't build your electrical system on this, but you would build the concept of your electrical system on something like that. Shows you one panel, a second panel. We've got inverters. What does an AC do? You could run an AC fridge, AC outlets, microwave. You could run a hot water tank. You could run a charger. That's basically AC for the most part. And on the bigger boats, it could be air conditioning. It could be uh, some people run AC water makers. It could be all these AC, big AC appliances that you'll maybe encounter on a boat. Okay, but again, we're going to revisit that multiple times today. Conceptually, that's what you're looking at. You've got a generator. You might have two generators. You might have three generators, right? It's possible. You've got shore. You might have forward shore, aft shore, right? And then you're going to have an inverter, and some boats have multiple inverters. But at a simple kind of electrical AC system, that's sort of what you're looking at, and it can grow from there. All right, so... With that, we're going to start with batteries. Batteries are, for me, the heart, the beating heart of an electrical system for boats that are probably, I'd say, up to about 90, 100 feet. Once you get to a certain threshold, the boat's just running on generators. The batteries are just there to start the engines, run maybe some loads for a few hours, maybe. But when you talk about the big 100-footers, 100 150-footers that we work on, those boats are running basically generators nonstop. Port, starboard, running. And then at night, the loads drop down and they run off a generator, a small generator called the night gen. For them, they're generator boats. But for most of us, we're basically running our electrical system in large part from batteries. And we'll talk about the different ways of recharging batteries, but they're really at the heart and the center of your electrical system on your boat. So we'll talk about, and I'm showing this slide to demonstrate all the different battery types and sizes that are possible on a boat. There's a lot of selection, and we're going to make sense of what the selection is like. So the first thing you're thinking about is, and this is where batteries started, really. I mean, it's, they were cranking batteries. Batteries were, you know, you think about 100 years ago, batteries were installed on boats to start the engine. And, they were, and that's what we have in our cars. They're cranking batteries. But also, they can be used, a good cranking battery example would be also a thruster. A thruster is a device that demands a large amount of current for a shorter period of time. So a thruster would be a very similar type of battery as a cranking battery, right? 
ultimately needs to be recharged. There's some issues on some boats where thruster battery banks are actually not getting recharged unless you're back at shore power, and that's a problem. Will cause premature failure of the thruster because the batteries are brought down under use and they're not getting a charge until you connect back to shore power. And they're not left to, designed to be left on charge. You know, generally a flooded lead acid battery wants to be charged on a float charger used regularly. And that's something else we'll talk about a little bit and I'll emphasize that point. And this is key. Batteries are built for a purpose. I can tell you that I, every summer, probably between a, about a half a dozen boats, I get a phone call from a distressed owner that a battery exploded on their boat. And generally that battery that exploded was a starter battery used in a deep cycle application because starter batteries are less expensive than deep cycle batteries. Somebody decided to cut a corner, buy and install a starter battery in a deep cycle application, used it for a couple seasons, and at the end of the day, the battery was cycling so hard that literally the water, the distilled water, the, the, the electrolyte evaporated, the batteries got dry, they warped, that warped caused the plates to touch, the battery's full of hydrogen gas, and that explosion is not a firecracker, it's a real explosion. On one boat, it actually removed the hatch on the back deck and threw it literally off the hinges. Like, it, like the battery box exploded, the hatch went completely flying, and it's terrifying. So when you're thinking about batteries on your boat, batteries are built for a specific purpose. Really important. <clears throat> and when you buy those batteries, you're buying them in basically what are called cranking amps or cold cranking amps, CCA. So it's the ability of the battery to deliver an amount of amps for a short period of time. So here's an example of an 8D flooded lead acid battery. Okay, notice the fill caps at the top for the distilled water. Deep cycle batteries, lots again, lots of choice, lots of choice. We'll talk about that. Deep cycle batteries for me, and I'm always thinking about analogies because I got to make all this technical jumbo jump stuff make sense. To me, what is it? It's basically a marathon runner, right? And a starter battery is a sprinter. They're both athletes, but they have completely different physiques. This battery, a deep cycle battery, is meant for a, a long, slow discharge, where the amps aren't too high, and you're gonna be using that battery for a discharge for maybe 24 hours, it could be 12 hours, it could be, on my boat, it could be for four days based on the battery bank size, right? Slow discharge. And the capacity of that battery is measured in amp hours, and we're gonna revisit that later. And that's sort of, a, sort of like a kilogram or a, a kilometer. It's a unit that is definable. How many amp hours do you have in a battery bank? So, there's really two types of lead acid batteries on board. There's what we consider and are commonly that we had all in our cars maybe 20 years ago, which are called flooded lead acid batteries, right? And you can buy a flooded lead acid battery for a starter application, a deep cycle application, or what's called a dual purpose, right? Sort of like you're neither good at one or the other. I generally don't recommend using a dual purpose battery. There are some exceptions. Every rule, most rules have exceptions. This has very few of them. Generally, if you buy a battery, buy it for a specific purpose. You know, it's like winter tires. Buy winter tires for winter, summer tires for summer. Don't buy all seasons. If you live in a place where you actually have a winter and you have a summer, you're not gonna put an all season tire. It's, it's a compromise. So that's why I'm not a big fan of dual purpose batteries. And then the second type of battery are what are called sealed valve regulated batteries, SVR. And a lot of people are gonna use that word interchangeably with the word gel. Because gel was the first SVR battery to come out. And I often find boaters telling me, Jeff, I have gel batteries. What they mean to say is I have an SVR battery, seal valve regulated battery, and in actuality, their battery is an AGM battery. AGM batteries are extremely prevalent. Uh, Mercedes, BMW put them by default in their cars now. So it's not a crazy futuristic battery. AGM stands for absorbed glass matte battery. 
So that means that there is no way to fill the batteries. There's no way, there's no maintenance. The electrolyte is actually enclosed in a glass mat. And a gel battery, the electrolyte is enclosed in a gel. You could literally drill a hole in it, puncture it, nothing will come out. In a flooded lead acid battery, you literally have sulfuric acid in a liquid state within that battery. Now, the plates are all lead acid here, okay? We're, we're limiting our conversation for today, for the seminar, we're talking about lead acid batteries. And the other battery now is an enhancement on lead acid AGM is the carbon foam AGM, which is the Firefly battery. So, what do we know about flooded lead acid batteries? Flooded lead acid batteries are, I'm putting one dollar sign, and we'll see the multiples of dollar signs, depending on the size of the battery, because the cost of the battery changes with the amount of lead you buy in the battery, right? It's pretty linear. They're the least expensive batteries. Now that is under the assumption that you will follow through on the maintenance of that battery religiously without exception, regardless of the excuses that you might be able to come up with over time. So in actuality, for most boaters, what happens is they'll start off digitally to re replace the electrolyte, but over time, they forget, they delay. And eventually that delay causes premature damage. So the battery is in a liquid elect acid electrolyte, right? So we see that all the time. You need, and this is very important, if you have flooded lead acid batteries, you can't just have a tray, you need a battery box. But not just a battery box, you need a battery box that does not have holes in the bottom of it. It needs to be a literally liquid tight container. I get the privilege, and honestly I think it's an honor, I probably do about 500 electrical audits a year. That's besides the thousand projects we do. I do maybe 10 a week, sometimes 15. And when I do electrical audits, I see commonly what are the problems on boats. And I would say more than half of you have a battery box, and that battery box has holes in the bottom. Because when the owner, whoever put that battery box in, it didn't come with a manual, and whoever put it in looked at the box and said, well, how am I gonna hold this battery box down? Most people don't like reading, right? Remember that theme I was saying, do it like a pro? Meaning, educate yourself. Most people don't like that. Just get it done, do it, just do it. They drill four holes in the four corners of the battery box, they defeat the whole purpose of the battery box, and they think the battery box is some sort of cover to hide the batteries. It's not a battery, it's not to hide the batteries, it's actually a battery box for flooded lead acid batteries, it's actually to contain them. So that's really important. If your battery box is magically held into place, and there is no sides on it, like we use a lot of aluminum sides on the sides, or like for example, Grand Max will actually have wood on the side of the battery box, and then they'll have a strap, so the battery box can't move laterally, and then it can't jump up. If your battery box looks like it's just there and somehow held in place magically, that means that you probably have four screws in the four corners, and the whole purpose of the battery box was defeated by the installer. <clears throat> you gotta to top up with distilled water only, Right, really essential. You can't put tap water. So, you know, uh, we find that in pharmacies all the time. You can buy distilled water in a probably gallon jug. And here's a really good point. A flood of lead acid battery will self-discharge by about 15% a month. That's why people that have the privilege of living down south, like my, for example, my folks have a little place in Florida. In the summer when they're not there, someone actually drives their car once a month. And they do that to maintain the batteries. If they left the car in the parking lot for six months, the car battery would be dead if it's a flooded lead acid battery. A lead acid battery will self-discharge even if there are no loads. You could have it in your garage on a shelf. It will self-discharge by about 15%. And here's an important, very, very, very important point. And this is where the distinction is key, okay? I cannot emphasize this enough with batteries. What you see is what you get. Because with a flooded lead acid battery, your practical available or usable battery capacity is about 35%. Why? You never want to discharge below 50% to get a reasonable amount of cycles. Cycles is the number of times you can use that battery. <clears throat> and realistically, when you're charging it, unless you have endless time, but you're charging with an alternator or a generator or whatever it is, you'll never get, a, it takes forever to go above 85 to 100. 
So your useful bookends, right, between 85 and 50 is about <clears throat> 35%. So when you look at a flooded lead acid battery bank, you're only ever gonna be able to use a third. Another way to describe that is if you have a 600 amp hour battery bank, you're only getting about 200 of usable amp hours out of that battery bank. Because that top end takes forever to recharge. Okay, so that's why I get this a lot of times. People always ask, they say, Jeff, why such a big battery bank? Well, I'm like, because that's what we need. Right? We're, not thinking, we're not just throwing batteries and hoping it works. We're going to do the math. How much do you use? And we'll talk about that. And we size the, that battery bank on use. Okay? So with a flooded lead acid battery, remember, and we're going to again revisit that later, you only have about 35% of usable battery capacity. Can you tell with a voltmeter the state of your battery? We're going to talk about that. It's going to come. That's on one of my slides. So here's an example, a really popular battery that we use. It's called an L16. And I'm trying to demonstrate here how batteries come in all different sizes. Right? And this is a flooded lead acid battery. It's sort of like a big golf cart. Instead of being about 11 inches and three quarters, it's 16 inches high. And it offers generally about double the amp hour capacity okay, of a golf cart battery. So gel batteries. Gel batteries are now, we're in a different type. We, we just talked about flooded lead acid batteries. Now we're talking about gel. So gel is a SVR battery, seal valve regulated battery. And remember, when people are going to say I have gel on their boat, what they probably mean is AGM, but gel came first. So everyone thinks that SVR and gel are the same word. So we talked about that. They're seal valve regulated. No maintenance is required. There's no caps. There's nothing. That's it. You don't, you're not involved for maintaining those batteries. Now here's the catch, and this is critical. Gel batteries aren't that popular, and there's a reason. They are very sensitive, like every battery, to overcharging. And the problem is a stock alternator and a stock battery charger that charges at about a 12 volts, 14.4 volts, will overcharge that battery, and within a week or two weeks, that battery will be dead. So if you go on blogs, and I remember reading on blogs in 2004, 2005, people were really dismissive of gel batteries. They thought it was just a direct replacement. I have a flooded, I put a gel, it's just gonna work. It doesn't work like that. Everything has to be tailored on the charging side to a gel battery. And so that's the challenge with that battery is that it's not easy to retrofit a boat with gel because you need to make sure that the alternator is an overcharge. So that means you need an external regulator, which we're gonna talk about. You need to have a battery charger that has a gel setting. And gel settings vary a lot from battery manufacturer to manufacturer. So you need to have one that coincidentally aligns with what the manufacturer wants. It's a, overcharging a battery is a really, really quick way of killing it. Undercharging is a slow death, but overcharging is a very quick death. All right, now here's the interesting point only self-discharge about 2% a month. Now that's interesting, because that means that that battery can be left un unattended for a period of time, right? And so, for example, one of the big projects we did one year was we basically converted all of the DFO's boat, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, from lead-acid batteries to AGM. Why? Because the, bat the boats are left in hangars in different places, and the operators would come on board, and they'd show up and the battery would be dead because someone forgot to turn the charger on. But with AGM, the battery doesn't self-discharge as much, or gel. And so they'd come in and the battery would be good enough to start the engine. So that's why um, they went with AGM. Now, why 55% of usable capacity? Well, because under bulk charging, you can go all the way with a reasonable amount of cycles to 30%. The floor is 30%. So your range is 55 now. Okay, 55 versus flooded acid battery was now 35. So that's a big gain because 55 over 35 is about a factor of one and a half. So just by going to gel, you're actually having needing less batteries to do the same amount of work. So you only need a 400 amp hour battery bank versus a 600 for flood of lead acid. Okay. AGM batteries. So that stands for absorb glass mat battery. It's another seal valve regulated battery. The purchase costs about twice the price of a flood of lead acid battery. Again, seal valve regulated, so 
Commonly, people might have their batteries on, for example, it happens a lot on sailboaters, under a bed. They might have it under a cabin. If you have it in one of your cabin, under a bed, you need to make sure, if it's a flooded lead acid battery, you need to make sure there's going to be a lot more venting of hydrogen gas when it's charging. This one still does it, but it keeps up to five atmosphere of pressure within the battery. So it does gas, but it gas very little. So that's a good choice for, and I have this up in all the time, where people are installing batteries, not in the engine room, but they're actually installing the, bed, the, ba the batteries under a bed in a cabin. And so AGM would be a good application for that. You still need ventilation, but you need less of it. No maintenance is required. That's a big key. And again, the self-discharge is only 2%. So that's a good, good point. Again, luckily, because it's seal valve regulated, you can also get 55% of usable battery capacity. Okay? So here's what an AGM battery looks like, and this is a Group 31 battery. You'll notice at the top of the battery, there's actually no, no fill caps, right? And I can't emphasize this enough, and I was at Nigel Calder's talks. Maybe some of you were there two years ago, and he came. Uh, it's actually right here, isn't it? And he had the full auditorium, and he was talking about Lead acid batteries don't die, they get murdered. And he agreed, and I will agree with him, of course, is that everyone starts on the best intentions with a flood of lead acid battery. Everyone can promise themselves that they will maintain that battery religiously and they will do everything that is required by that battery. That's easy to promise, but to literally do it, to fulfill that promise over four, five, six, seven years, and remember, the battery doesn't understand and will never forgive. Regardless of what your excuses are. Oh, my daughter got married. Oh, I went to Europe for three months. Oh, I was sick. Oh, I got busy at work. All those reasons don't matter to the battery. If ever the plates get exposed, you cause permanent damage to a flood of acid battery. And then that's the same story it goes, oh, I wonder why my batteries don't last long. Right? I have, unfortunately, some boaters are stubborn. They're like, no, I'm not, filling, I'm not filling it. Now, their batteries don't last five years. They last two years. But that's what it is. They need to be maintained to keep that cost down. So now we've got another battery, which is another version of an AGM, which is called the Firefly battery. Huge proponent. I've installed it on my own boat. Now, mind you, it's three times the price up front than a flood of acid battery. Three times. But why would you spend three times the price of something? And here's what we're going to find out. Leak proof, obviously. We talked about limited gassing, maintenance free. Now this is a killer. On the Firefly, you can actually go, and we'll talk about charge rate. The charge rate is basically almost limitless. It's 3C, meaning three times the battery capacity, which is, means it can take whatever you throw at it. Okay, a normal AGM is about between 40%. This battery, there is, you'll never be able to recharge it at max speed. There's no charger. You can't. So if you have, for example, a 300 amp hour, imagine a 400 amp hour battery bank. Four, just four golf carts. Pretty standard, right? It's not a big battery bank. It could take a 1200 amp charge rate. Now think about 1200 amps. Where are you going to get 1200 amps? So basically what it says is the battery is sort of like lithium. Lithium is, does the same thing. It can take a high charge rate. Whatever you can throw at the battery under bulk, it will take it. That's a big, big advantage with the Firefly. Here's killer, is the battery has 12 times the battery life of a flooded lead acid battery. At the same floor discharge, like to like, so if we go apples to apples, at 50% depth of discharge, a flooded lead acid battery will give you around 300 cycles. And Firefly AGM will give you 3,600 cycles. 36 versus 300. I joke around when we install it on boats, I say it's almost a family heirloom. You know, you're going to install it and one day you'll pass it on to your children and you'll be like, here you go, I didn't get a chance to use it all, but why don't you have it now? That's basically a Firefly battery. And the L15 battery is 4,700 cycles. At one point, it's sort of like, you might not live forever, but if you made it to 1,000, that's probably close enough. You know, that's the advantage of the Firefly battery. It was invented by Caterpillar. Well, they didn't invent it. They basically created an R&D project. And uh, now it's bought, been bought out. But it was invented for, actually, Caterpillar. So 3,600 cycle versus 300. 
That's a big deal. Now think about, some of you don't boat that much, you might not use that, or you're gonna change your boat soon. But if you love your boat, and you're gonna use your boat a lot, or you're gonna go you know, for long cruises, this battery is the last battery you're gonna end up putting on your boat. And if it wasn't good enough, and you're like, well, this is just ridiculous. And when I saw all these pros about six, seven years ago, I was very doubtful. I didn't do it. I was like, this is too good to be true. This is ridiculous. I mean, honestly, you could have had me at twice better. Three times is still ridiculous. The big cincher with that battery is it does not age at a partial state of discharge. All other batteries kiss of death. Why they never do what the battery says on the label is that a battery, once it's discharged, needs to be recharged 100% the moment it's discharged. That's called lab testing, right? You take a battery from 100%, you bring it down, and then you, the moment it's done, they don't go for lunch, they don't wait a week, they recharge it right now, and then they'll do another test. And that's how they figure the number of cycles you can do. The reality on our boats is far from that. When is it that we discharge a battery and the moment we get to 50%, we're like, oh, you're gonna get recharged right away back to 100. And I'll never keep you in a partial state of discharge, meaning from 50 to 85, 85 to 70, 70 to 90, 90 back to 50. You know, we're always oscillating when we're cruising, when we're out using our boat. We don't get the advantage of plugging in every night to bring back the battery to 100%, most of us. And so that's the real big benefit of a Firefly battery is it can live in this partial state of discharge without aging. Two sizes, Group 31 and L15 Plus. And the other gets better is that the usable battery capacity for bulk charge is 85 to 20%. So again, with that battery, you need less batteries to do the same amount of work, okay? So you need only a 300 battery, amp hour battery bank to give you 200 amp hours of usable battery capacity. So let's, let's stop for a second and just think, why does that matter? Well, you could have a boat where you have limited battery space, but you want more capacity. Like I have a lot of sailboaters, they can only fit X amount of batteries. I was on a Genoa just four days ago. When I say I, I don't mean I, I mean my team. Uh, but the owner had limitations, we wanted more battery capacity. And how do you add more battery capacity on a boat that is completely physically constrained? There is simply no space other than mounted on the floor. Where are you gonna put the batteries? I, it's not a barn, I can't just add more batteries in a corner. I have so much space and how do I give more capacity to a boater that now is cruising and less, less of dock to dock? Well, one way is to go with AGM. And you've got AGM, the normal vanilla, which gives you about 55%, or you go with Firefly, gives you 65%. So effectively, you can have more battery capacity by not increasing your battery bank, but by just changing to a Firefly battery. Or you could also have, I have other boaters that say to me, Jeff, weight matters. I wanna save weight. I, you know, they could be racers. I, I care about weight. I, my boat is healed too much on one side even on big boats, trawlers. I have too much batteries on this side. You can see it, I don't wanna carry lead, I like the plane. I don't wanna carry all this weight in the back. Can I have the same usable battery capacity, but save the weight? And now the list on my boat that's offset because I've added too much batteries over time, I can reduce that battery weight by going to Firefly batteries and not have to offset the weight by putting lead on the other side of the boat. So these are what they kinda of look like, you've got an Two only two sizes, no golf carts. I know it's disheartening, but it is what it is. You've got the L15, which is a tall one. And then you have the Firefly, uh, the other one, the Group 31. So this is an install we did. Um, you can see six of them, they're all in parallel. Here's a good way to tell, right? The jumpers are going positive to positive to positive, so it's a 12 volt bank. Notice as well, I just wanna make sure I do this right. Um, notice we've got a decent sized battery strap. The cables are at opposite ends of the bank. You know, you've got a, a positive here and the negative over there. And we've got a temperature sensor in the middle of the battery bank. We'll talk about that, but those are really important takeaways. So that's a 660 amp hour Firefly battery bank. All right, so 
How do you go about, and this is what I do when we're doing what I call scope outs or electrical audits with other voters, is like, well, Jeff, how do we go figuring out? We just don't want to throw money. We want to make sure we do what is right for our boat. So when we size a battery bank, the first thing we ask ourselves is, what is your daily power needs? We've got to have a sense of what your budget is going to be. Budget means how much money, for example, a good way for battery capacity, I always like to relate to money because it's, it's sort of a very limited thing. It's hard to earn it. You don't want to be too, you want to be thrifty. You don't want to spend it too easily. You want to be able to store it. And so that analogy really carries well with batteries. So first thing is, how, many, how much do you use in a day? What's your typical amp hour budget? And what I'm trying to say on this slide is, remember, it might vary depending on when you boat. Same boater in, for example, just myself. When I boat in the fall, I use more power in the fall, or even worse, in the winter, because in the winter I'm using heat, the lights are on longer, right? All those things are drawing power on my batteries. Same boater boating in July in Desolation Sound is gonna use less power than the same boater in Desolation Sound at Christmas where the light is only maybe eight hours a day and it gets to five degrees Celsius in the winter time. Okay, so that's really good. So think about, am I just doing your amp hour budget? Am I budgeting my batteries to just do summer or am I gonna do them fall and spring or am I also gonna look at my batteries for winter as well? Here's a typical battery usage. I, I'm using this as, you know how sometimes people think about salaries, they're thinking, oh, I, 100K, 50K, right? We can start relating. You know, we're not talking about, oh, I make 100 million. I mean, those numbers don't make sense to any of us. But you say, oh, 50K, you know, 100K, okay, that's tangible, relatable. In amp hour budgets, the numbers really range between, for the most part, maybe 85 to 500 amp hours at 12 volts, okay? 12 volts, for the most part. Now, have I been on a boat that uses 500 amp hours at 24? Yes, of course. There's always outliers, right? But in the, the majority, you know, you're thinking about sailboats, you're gonna be maybe, you're really efficient. You don't even have a refrigerator, right, on your boat. Well, then your amp hours are gonna go way down. You might only be using 40 amp hours. Refrigeration is the number one draw. The way I describe it, it's like having a Vancouver mortgage. You might be frugal in everything else in your life, but if you have a mortgage in Vancouver, most of your money is going to your mortgage. On a boat, you might be frugal at everything you do. Most of your power goes to refrigeration, regardless of the boat size. The bigger the boat, the more refrigerators they have, and that's what it is. And the fridges are just bigger in the galley, and then there's one in the salon, and there's one on the flybridge, and there's one on the aft deck. So there's just more and more and more refrigerators on a boat, and that's the number one power draw on a boat. If you can live without cold anything, it's sort of like being mortgage free in Vancouver. Power is really then not a big issue, okay? So, all right, we figured out what your daily amp hour budget, but the next thing you gotta figure out is like, how long am I gonna use my boat for without recharging? Because that's the amount of batteries you need to carry. Some boaters are fortunate, they have a generator and they're gonna run their generator twice a day. Well, so they're only gonna need their batteries to last them half a day. Other boaters are gonna say, Jeff, I wanna use my boat and I don't wanna recharge my boat for two days before I recharge. So then they need twice what their daily amp hour budget. So for example, at a minimum, what I'm trying to say there is if you've got a daily amp hour budget of 200 and you're saying, I want two days, you're gonna to need to have 400 amp hours. Sort of like traveling. You know, if you're going somewhere and you're spending $200 a day and you're going for two days, you need $400 in your pocket to last two days. So that's how you figure out what is gonna be your total target that you need for a battery bank. And that sounds, I know it sounds a lot tedious, but you know what? There's a method to the madness. This is why it all works. It comes back to planning, to design, to doing things with thought. Not just saying, oh, well, there's four batteries on my boat, that's what I need. No, sit back, think, why, right? And if you do it right, you do it once, and then it's gonna work. So, recap, we talked about what's called the battery floor, right? The, how deep can you go on a battery? You can go maybe with a Firefly AGM all the way to 20%, and a flooded, it's higher, it's 50. So, if you are figuring, basically, these are the numbers that we talked about, right? Flooded battery is 35% of usable, AGM, gel, 55, and if you end up with Firefly, you even have more, you have 65 of usable. So here's a recap of all of this. 
I don't do gel, not because gels aren't good, it's just there's very few people that actually have gels, very few. They're great batteries, but it's just more tricky to improve your boat with gel. Generally, if it has gel, we'll keep gel, but to switch to gel is more expensive. So that's why we normally don't do gel. So I'm trying to recap here. You can see the dollar signs, right? So if you're gonna buy an AGM Firefly battery, don't be, sh don't be surprised by the cost. It's gonna be three times more than a normal battery. But why would you spend more for something? And I used to try to have a hard time expressing that. Well, that to me, I was thinking about it, it's value, right? What you pay and what you get. It's not about just the cost of something, because something that can be cheap can be probably the most expensive thing you're gonna buy, right? So you've gotta ask yourself as a boater, where does this all make sense to me, right? Am I gonna be able to follow digit, like to the T my maintenance of a flood to lead acid battery? Is it a place where I don't care about gassing? Is it a place where I'm actually gonna use it all the time and I don't care about self-discharge? All those factors are gonna help you decide which battery is right for you as a boater. Sorry, Jeff, just uh, yeah. purpose. Does that mean you can use it as a cranking at a house battery? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So with AGM, you can really use them for both. And that's a good point. You know, with a flight of acid battery, you got to say, am I buying a deep cycle battery or am I buying a starter battery? With AGM, you can use it for both. So. Basically, with flooded, you got to multiply times three. So if you need 200 amp hour batteries of usable, you'll need 600 amp hour battery bank. If you do AGM gel, you only need 400. If you go Firefly, you only need 300. So you actually need less batteries if the better the battery is, right? Or you spend, you buy more batteries, but you have more capacity. So it's a trade-off, right? What are you going to do? with that available space. You're gonna save weight, or you're gonna take more weight and have more usable battery capacity so you can stay at anchor longer or run more loads. So what I'm trying to emphasize here, and this is a really important takeaway. <clears throat> people get, we all assume, and I did the same thing when I started off. People think that, oh, I have a golf cart battery, that can't be AGM. Oh, I have a AD, it's flooded. All batteries come in different chemistries. Okay, so first of all, there are known dimensions. Sort of like wood, two by four, two by three, four by eight. It's a physical, someone came up with a battery size and then everyone else mimicked that size. And it's a known battery size. So when you buy a golf cart, it could be a golf cart from East Pandeca, it could be a Canadian Tire golf cart, it could be a Costco golf cart, golf cart, it could be whatever, Lifeline, it doesn't matter what you buy, it's all one golf cart size. So they're interchangeable in terms of like when you take them out, you can put another golf cart in its place. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that you can buy most of these batteries from large manufacturers in different types of chemistries. Do you gonna buy it in flooded, AGM, gel? And then for flooded batteries, remember, you've gotta buy it for a purpose. Never fall trap. And if you've bought a used boat that's been sitting for a period of time and the owner's not that engaged, and you're dealing with someone that is looking to make problems go away, I've often seen boats, especially when you buy them for used, where someone, the batteries are dead, they're trying to get rid of the boat, they're trying to keep costs down, and so they're replacing the batteries, and when they go to a battery shop and they see a deep cycle battery that is twice the price of a starter lead acid battery, they're gonna go for a starter battery because they look the same. They absolutely look the same on the outside. And they'll put them in, and they're like, oh, I have new batteries. But what they're not telling you is they took a corner. They, they, they basically, they're, they're, you're not, they're not gonna pay the price. You will over time. So I've seen so many boats with ADs where the starting batteries are used in a deep cycle application. And that's those boats where the batteries explode. And you can imagine what happens to electrolyte that explodes in an engine compartment full of metal. I mean, this is not, it's not confetti, right? It's not just, oh, well, let's just clean it up. It's no big deal. Like, it's a life event. Is that only with the flooded? Or yeah. yeah, yeah, only with the flooded. So one takeaway from this presentation is when you go back to your boat, if you have flooded lead acid batteries, make sure that those batteries are built for the purpose you're using them, okay? So here we're talking about the ideal charge rate. A big 
issue that I see a lot of times, and we get called up about this all the time, people are basically thinking that whoever designed their boat future-proofed it for all innovations in all directions. So whoever built their boat in 1985 put in, for example, and you'll see this, this is the ratio where all the builders do. They always install a charger to be 10% of the battery capacity. That's the formula. That's the minimum, that's what they do. So if you have 400 amp hour battery bank, deep cycle, you'll have a 40 amp charger, right? 10% of 400 is 40 amps. Great. Now you decide that you're not satisfied with 400 amp hour battery bank, you put an 800 amp hour battery bank. That charger, it's not about time, right? You're like, well, it's just gonna take twice the time. If you don't have the ability to bulk charge at the right rate of charge, you will cause a slow death to your batteries. Your batteries will die prematurely, not suddenly, but they're gonna sulfate. Every time you charge them, because you don't have enough pressure, right, because of the amps, you're gonna charge a fraction of a fraction, and your batteries will die prematurely. So don't get too excited when you change your battery bank. You gotta think, is my charger capable of charging that battery bank at the right rate of charge? And the minimum is 10%. As you get better and better batteries, they can take a higher rate of charge. Like lithium can take, some batteries can be up to 3C. So three times capacity. Firefly is the same. Now, nobody practically is ever gonna be able to do that. You can't find a charger that outputs 600 amps. It's not gonna happen. But you can start maybe taking advantage of two chargers, one that does 150 and another one that does 100, to get 250 amps, right? So there's abilities of reducing your charge time by what is what we do commonly is called daisy changing chargers, meaning putting multiple chargers in one battery bank to reduce the gen set runtime. So your generator, instead of running for maybe on some boats, and this is quite common, they're running the generators eight hours a day, and after we're done, they're running the generators two hours a day. I mean, that's an emotional response from an owner. Like, to hear a generator run eight hours a day, I personally would leave the generator running all the time. At one point, it's just white noise. I'm just giving in. I'm like, I'm going on a generator boat. But they don't want to. Eight hours is just annoying enough. Instead of doing four hours in the morning, four hours at night, they're doing an hour in the morning, an hour at night. Or other owners are saying, I'm only running the generator every other day for a couple hours. And you do that by adding more chargers. And if you go with AGM batteries, you can do that. All right, so here are a bunch of things that you need to worry about when you're installing a battery bank. And because I'm not gonna cover all of them, but at the end of the day, we talked about what's really important. You need to have, for sure, a leak-proof container if you're gonna have flooded lead acid batteries, right? That's really important. Make sure that that battery box is gonna stay in place. So how are you gonna do that? You're gonna put maybe aluminum L guards around the battery box. Put a heavy-duty battery strap. Make sure the battery is actually physically gonna stay there, not at the dock when everything is benign, but when you're out boating and you're in following seas and all your dishes are flying everywhere and it's the worst, you cannot have a battery bank that weighs 400 pounds, 800 pounds, 1,000 pounds start moving in your engine compartment. Okay, they need to be latched down. You want to also make sure that all leads going to the battery are fused and we're going to talk about that. That is essential, no exceptions. Your previous owner, there's no, I've never, well never, but almost, 99.999% seen a boat from the factory that is done unsafely. It just doesn't happen. I don't care what brand it is, there's just too much liability. They're gonna go out of business. You do that at the factory level, you get sued, you lose your shirt, you're done. No factory is ever building a boat unsafe. What happens is the previous owner has a time crunch, wants to get it done, wants to prove to himself that they can do it. And they just are happy, like a grow up, where they just tap into the power lines. No circuit breakers, no nothing, uh, whatever, doesn't matter. There's never gonna be an accident, and they don't fuse. And you'll often find on a boat that has had multiple owners where the battery bank becomes this craziness of unfused wires that provide the functionality you want, but in the event of a problem, like a seat belt, it's gonna be useful when you get in an accident, right? Doesn't mean you have it and you haven't used it, that it's useless. And that's the important thing, and we'll talk about fusing later, but fusing is absolutely essential. So here are some other battery banks that we've done. That was on a, actually an 85 footer. So we replaced 12 two volt cells, right? 
So these are the gin palaces, you know, like the beautiful boats from the 70s. 12 2 volt cells, or 6 2 volt cells, I mean. And uh, we replaced it with a battery bank. We have one on port and starboard. So this is a big boat. And then here's another one. It's about another. The most we've done on one boat is 32. Now that boat, the owner didn't want to think about power. So we're like, this is my type of problem. I got this. And they were very happy. The boat goes on charter, and the charteries don't want to think about anything. So they're like, OK, <laughs> we'll do it. So that's sort of like, and these are Group 31 batteries. Here's another example. You'll see I'm using heavy duty stainless steel straps. As a sailor, I'm going, I'm going crazy. I'm thinking, I want, obviously with a power boat, you can't do that. But on a sailboat, I'm like, the boat can be inverted. I don't want the batteries to move because around the battery might be a through haul. And if you have 200 pounds of weight, 300, 400 pounds of weight that lands sideways on your through haul, is your through haul going to hold? Do you want to have a hole in your boat? I don't know if you've ever opened a through haul in your boat just for the fun of it and not have a pipe connected to it and see the rate at which water comes in through your boat on a half inch through haul. It is terrifying. Like bilge pumps are not there to save you in case you have a hole in your boat. It's just for nuisance water, right? So I'm always thinking, and it's all about always thinking about safety, right? Like, what happens if? And so you can see right here, like I've got aluminum all around the battery, right? Straps. Like, I want this thing to be there forever. I don't want them to move. So here's a common thing. I do these electrical audits, right? Called on a boat, spent about an hour and a half with an owner, and we go through stuff. And I commonly see on a flooded lead acid battery, this is a flooded lead acid battery, I see electrolyte on top of the battery. The first reaction from the boater is, no, that's water. My battery's moist. It's sweating. I'm like, okay, sure. But why is the rest of your engine room not sweating? Because water does not just locate. This is not a microclimate where only one part of your engine room sweats and not the other. So if you have lead acid on top of you or water on top of your battery, that's not water, that's electrolyte. That electrolyte will never evaporate, it's sulfuric acid. And if you have a battery box that has holes in the bottom, it's actually gonna leak through and then go to whatever is underneath, some sort of plywood that's in glass, right? And then sulfuric acid will eat through the wood. It's just this craziness scenario. It's really painful, you wanna avoid that. So again, to recap, if you have a battery box, make sure there's, it's a container. That's the purpose of your battery box for flooded lead acid batteries. Here's an owner that refuses to do battery maintenance. Refuses, just simply, and refuses to buy the AGM. Now, we see him regularly every two years. So that's fine, you know, uh, whatever. I can't force him to fill the batteries with distilled water. But this is a battery cap. Look at what happens to the plates. They've actually literally breached, they buckled, and the plates are touching, and that's called a dead short. Now, if the battery was full of, a, of actually gas, hydrogen gas, when that happens, as the plates touch, you'll have a short, and that's what causes an explosion, right? Because you have hydrogen gas in a container. I mean, that's sort of what a bomb is, right? And so never, ever, 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 that's a black and white, ever have your battery plates exposed. If they do get exposed, you're basically in a downward spiral where you're gonna constantly gonna have to top off. The batteries are gonna basically heat up prematurely. And so you're in a losing game. You're just, you can fight it, but that percentage of battery capacity is gonna effectively be lost. And at that point, you might as well just assume, take the blame, change the batteries, and tell yourself you won't do it again, or go to the AGM. The other big point, um, these are L16 batteries, the tall ones. Uh, and I mentioned that, make sure the positive and negatives are at opposite ends of the battery bank. That's essential so your batteries are evenly charged and discharged. I know it sounds unimportant, but it does make a difference. And I'm going to, it's perfect, 59 minutes. So we're going to just take a small five minute break, take walk, go to the bathroom, and then we're going to start on power generation. But before we go, any questions on batteries? Yes. Well, it depends on, ideally, yes, especially if they're on the same charger. There are circumstances where 
on bigger boats, they'll have a house battery charger and they'll have an engine battery charger, right? They'll have what are called auxiliaries. So like for example, I was on a Meridian 490 and the battery charger for the engines, port, starboard, and genset is flooded and the house battery is on AGM. But if you want to make your life simple, you should go to AGM. All. You should. Yeah, question? Do you think each individual battery should have a fuse? Oh, in parallel circuits? Yeah, it's super rare. If it's really close, okay, that's a good question. Ideally, yeah, you, you could almost say yeah. Because I've had one of my gels spread out one time, and the shore power was trying to bring it up to voltage. Yeah, it can. The other batteries. It did. Yeah, you're right. Practically, I've never seen it. Theoretically, it might make sense. It might. But then you might also have, you know, fuses are great in a Star Trek world where you have a sensor on every fuse and you have a dash panel on the bridge and all fuses that are getting blown get a little mini robot that tells you it's there and it gets changed. But fuses, the more fuses you have, the more fuses you have to inspect, right? And you have to ask yourself, because if that fuse blew, let's say on one of your circuits for whatever reason, you'd lose the battery bank, right? If it's on a parallel situation and you have to, or the whole battery bank or a part of the battery bank would die. So I've never done it. I don't think it's, I understand your situation. I think that's such an exception. I personally wouldn't advise it, but you do make sure, and that's a good point though, that when your battery bank, you're doing a battery bank, if your battery bank is not in one location and you've got a battery bank on one side of the boat and another battery bank on the other side of the boat and they're actually wired together, the big link between the two, that has to be fused. So I worry about fusing for dead shorts, not for the situation that you're talking about. Because realistically anyways, when that gel battery died, you were gonna change all your other gel batteries anyways. So, because when a battery dies, you can't just, that's why batteries age together, right? Like you, you have to, you can't after seven years of having a gel bank, one battery dies and goes, oh great, I'm just gonna go change one battery. You can do it, but that battery will work so hard to pull the rest of the old batteries. So I, I, I've never seen it. Anything's possible, but I personally wouldn't do it. Yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. You didn't touch on lithium. Okay. Yeah, okay, lithium, I, sh I know. <laughs> I was going lithium has an absolute purpose. It does. Now, first of all, you got to be willing to spend money, okay? So there's no such thing as being frugal and going lithium, unless you're going to go offshore. And if you're going to go offshore, then that's fine because it's probably, then it makes a lot of sense. So what does lithium do? Lithium does a lot of great things. First of all, um, it has crazy amount of cycles. So people that are going to use their boat, like going offshore, or they're boating like four months in the summer, every summer for the next 20 years, like we're talking like 3,000 cycles, 5,000 cycles at like 20%, like going from 100 to 20. Like that's crazy. Like it's, like think about how many of us, we count the number of hours we use our boat or people brag to me like, oh, I use my boat 30 nights this year. Well, if you have this year, if you have a battery bank that lasts 3,000 cycles, your payback period takes a lot of, it's a, it's a family heirloom, right? Now, makes sense, think about like in, for example, in Scandinavia, they've got ferries that are going, they've actually done these ferries in lithium. They're actually powered hydro electrically by lithium. Now those boats are being used every day. They're going back to shore, right? They're being cycled constantly. Now that payback period makes complete sense. So the first thing you gotta ask yourself is, A, am I, do I love my boat? Rule number one. Unless you could be one that wants to brag, but that's pretty rare. It happens, but most people generally go lithium. They don't care about bragging. They generally love their boat. They need a lot of power in a small, compact, battery bank. So if you've got a boat that has limited space for batteries or where weight matters tremendously, that's another version, right? Because with smaller battery size, you have less weight, then lithium is a great choice. So really, really good for weight because it's energy, energy density. It has so much energy density. Now, all those things are good besides the cost because the cost is not for the weak of heart. And I'm talking like easily 10 grand for like, an, like a battery this big, right? US, like it's, like I've done battery banks lithium, it's 30 grand. So, you know, you gotta be in the realm of I'm okay to spend money. And the other challenge is that it's not a drop replacement because 
Your charger can be changed to lithium. Most of the modern ones are. But your alternator needs to then be regulated specifically for that battery bank from the charge profile, right? You can't, the, the battery at one point will communicate and, and if you overcharge it, depending on the type of battery that you bought, the lithium battery, it might actually disconnect itself and say, because it can't overcharge. And so when you overcharge, if you only have one positive post on that battery, some battery manufacturers will do a load post and a charge post. But if you only have one post, it might actually, you might lose everything on your boat. Like the whole boat goes black because you were overcharging it from an alternator. So it involves more thought. Like we were designing, we're designing a boat um, for another boater in the Middle East, small boat, and we're doing lithium. But it makes sense, you know, it, we're doing everything. Like it, that's easy, right? Like, it's like gel. For example, Tierra yachts, I mean, they make nice boats. They put gel in their boats, makes complete sense. They're building the boat from scratch. Everything is sized, they've got external regulators, the battery chargers are sized perfectly. And when we work on Tierra, we change gel for gel. Why? It's great battery, but it was done with a holistic view, a systems view, right? So with lithium, you're not just buying a battery. You gotta think about the whole system. So we do about a dozen of those a year. Yes? Doing amp hour calculations, where do you get the information? Uh, your battery bank or uh, uh, buying a battery? If you're thinking about the size of your battery bank, and I mean, you gave us general... Yeah, a size. battery monitor is the way... So the yeah, the monitor, and we'll talk about that later. A battery monitor is sort of a counter. It tells you what your daily consumption is. Or the other thing is you leverage other people's experience, right? So, you know, like on your boat, I can... When we did your boat with Firefly, I got a sense just by seeing the boat, experience helps. It's like golf. Like if you've played a lot of golf, you'll probably hit the green. You know what you're doing on the approach. I, on the other hand, playing golf would, I mean, I don't know if I'd hit the ball, right? So, so it's all about ex experience does pay. If you have none and you have no idea what it is, and this is the first time, if you have a battery monitor, then it's empirical. It's not a question. And sometimes with boaters that don't believe me, I'm like, okay, no problem. Let's go this, because I'm as an engineer, I'm like, I'm not gonna force you to make a decision. Why don't you come to the conclusion that your battery bank is too small? Let's start with a battery monitor. Let's just measure what you use every day, and let's just see if you have what you need. Easy, first step. They come in and like, let's do this early in the season so that we can change your battery bank before the season starts. And sure enough, I did one boat this summer, Another big sea ray about the size of yours, 55, 60 footer. And on that boat, the owner didn't want to go right away with changing batteries. It was, let's just use what we have. Let's see the pain. Sure enough, went out for a couple weekends. Yeah, the pain is there. Now I need to spend money. And if you need to spend money, it's always painful, but it's less painful than if you think you don't need to spend the money. And so battery monitor is an essential way to take the guesswork out of knowing what you use and knowing when to start charging and discharging your batteries. So battery monitor is the empirical way to do it. Yes, go ahead. Back to the first question. What if you have AGM batteries and you just want to upgrade to the carbon foam? Yeah, no problem. That's just a switch. It's pretty easy. I mean, you... No, there's no end in perfection, right? Like, that's why I love this field. There's no end. But at one point, you got to... Ideally, ideally, you'd want to have a perfect charger that you can set the set points. And that's in an ideal scenario. And sure, it is better. But not everyone has that benefit, right, of being able to dial in the charge pr profile for every battery. If you have a charger that has an AGM charge profile, Firefly batteries want 14.4 for bulk at 12 volts, and they want 13.5, 13.4 for float, which is a pretty common setting. So, you know, in an ideal, that's what you would dial in. Like if I can go in and with a laptop or put the dip switches, that's what you want in an ideal world. Not everyone has the luxury of having everything perfect. Yes, go ahead. Should you go change your uh, battery to a Firefly and you, just, you have an alternator, forget about the charger, but an alternator that's got an internal... Uh, Regulator? Yeah, so the question, should repeat the questions I've been told in this room. So the question is, if I've got a, if I'm going to switch to Firefly, right, and I have an alternator that has an internal regulator, will that alternator with an internal regulator overcharge my batteries. And that's the brilliant thing about AGM, 
is if any AGM wants something, it wants a little bit more than what the alternator can do. Meaning you'll never overcharge an AGM battery. You might undercharge it a little bit with your alternator, but your alternator is rarely ever going to bring a battery back to 100% because you're not using your alternator 12 hours a day, 24 hours a day. And that's not really the device that brings your battery back to complete 100%. So the, in short, again, because there's a difference between what is ideal and what is realistic, you can easily retrofit an AGM battery, Firefly or not, on a boat that has an internal regulator and you'll be fine, right? It's all about compromises, realistic compromises. And so, yeah, an internal regulator will do fine with an AGM battery. Yes? So the Firefly, like, with the lithium, I understand you can burn out your, uh, because it draws so much. That's right. Firefly won't have that issue. It won't draw to your alternator and burn it out. Absolutely. It's a really good question. The question is, lithium is so thirsty for capacity, for charge rate, that it's never, it goes from literally empty, let's say 20%, to full at full rate. It doesn't even almost do absorption. It goes full throttle and then suddenly it's like eating a buffet, but then your first bite is like your last bite. You're like chow, 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 and then suddenly it goes, stop. At least a lead acid battery, an AGM, Firefly, has an absorption. So it's only gonna do that in bulk. And you're right, we often, and that is something for sure. It's, it's a, but again, it's about compromises. In an ideal world, you would have an external regulator on an alternator, and we'll talk about that later, and you would dial it in, and you might put a field volt, like, so for example, I just did another boat. Um, I think it's a 50-foot Catalina. We're doing that next week. We put a high output alternator, we're gonna talk about, and an external regulator, but we're not gonna use the alternator at full capacity. When I was a kid, I never understood, like, why does my mom's Honda Accord have 180 kilometers an hour? I'm never gonna drive that speed. It's all, you don't want your alternator to be redlined, meaning you don't want, generally, your alternator to work so hard on the top end of the range, right? You wanna dial it back. So if you have a 100 amp alternator, you want it to work maybe at 60 amps, 70 amps. So there are ways to dial it back. Now, if you have an internal regulator, your internal regulator is gonna do that on your alternator anyways. If you have an external regulator, you might overwork the batteries if you're not careful if you have AGM. But very few of us have external regulators and we'll talk about that later. Any other questions before we take a little five, 10 minute break? All right, excellent. All right, see you in about five minutes. Thanks everyone.